Hi everyone, I'm Mike Novogratz and this is Next with Nova. All right, friends, it's Mike Novogratz. We're here at Next with Novo and I have the lovely Sarah Mayojas. Yes. Mayojas, everybody all at once. <laughs> um, we met um, at a criminal justice dinner uh, a few years ago and much to my surprise, Sarah wasn't just a criminal justice advocate, she was an artist uh, and a technologist. And so here we are today talking about the NFT space, the project she's got coming up, uh, and just her life in general. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so talk about New York City kid to artist. Right. So I went to Penn. I grew up in New York City. I went to Dalton. And then as a good Dalton graduate, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. And I studied finance and international studies. And then so you're did... pretty cliche at this point. Yeah, very cliche. Until I did a 360 into an MFA at Yale right out of undergrad. To become an artist. To become an artist. And it was just too many New York City kids going to Wall Street that you were just like, I can't be part of that crew. You know, it was kind of a bet because I had, and I still am interested in finance, right? But I had taken a few photography classes and I really, really enjoyed it. And I looked at the possibility of being a successful artist. It's like the best job in the world, right? If you can make it work, it's the most amazing thing. And so it was kind of a bet, like, let me go to grad school. I had gotten in, which was wild. And if it doesn't work out, I can always go back into finance. And if it does work out, then it's, I mean, I think it's, best career. So I had the luxury to be able to take that risk. So when I was in grad school, I, um, I was thinking a lot about the concept of value, right? Because art has a very interesting relationship to value, right? It is like the thing in the world where the input materially is compared to how much it's valued is the most divorced. Right. Compared to any other. Paint, canvas, that's it. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, people have compared it to like alchemy, right? You're turning a bunch of like raw materials into gold. So how does a young artist like look at this world and be like, okay, there's this kind of pyramid and how do you get noticed and how do you, how do you find your own tribe to care about the story you're telling? So I was seeing, you know, I was at the time while I was still in grad school, I was seeing this system. And I was like, I think I saw it for what it was, which is it's very much a network. It's very much about circulation, right? How is it circulating? With who is it circulating? How is it exchanged? Um, and so I decided to make an artwork that made that system clear, right? Um, and. I decided to enter the market, if you will, by creating a market where the whole work of art was in the exchange it, in a bit coming out of like relational aesthetics, which was a movement in art that focused on social relations. But I was locating it very much more like in the exchange. And that's um, so that's where the Bitcoin project uh, was initiated, which um, so. Bitcoin, the three trends that I kind of was seeing at the time, one was the financialization of the art world, two was the beginning of people turning themselves into brands, the influencer, and, um, and then blockchain and Bitcoin at the time. Right. This was, yeah, so this was, so 2014. So I found someone to help me on the internet to make an altcoin. And I did this project with uh, a Yale PhD student um, and another artist who had created like a gallery in a shipping container unit in Brooklyn. <laughs> and I, we turned the gallery into a mine. So it was painted pink and it had like mylar to make it super reflective and you could only see it via webcam. And it was mining bitch coins. 
<laughs> How do I get a bitch coin? <laughs> I gotta get a bitch coin. <laughs> and and um, and so, you know, I really love the idea as this the gallery as the mine. Yep. And but what was my bitch coin? You know, the bitch coin. What could I make it? worth something so I decided to back it like a backed currency at a fixed rate by my photography and I made a new series and that's where I started the series that I called speculations kind of apt to back yes. a cryptocurrency by speculation <laughs> well it's funny now we have these social tokens yes right so if you think about whale shark and the whale community you know, it started as a social community and the token just was given out to people that were curating the community or they were watching the community or participating. And then they end up backing it with NFTs he bought or they bought in the, in the whale vault. Uh, and so it's a whole new ecosystem. It, interesting. So you were kind of ahead of that idea of like, okay, we're going to back this with photography about speculating. Yeah. So, and also, you know, you, so it was backed by these physical prints and, and photography as a medium has has you know is kind of a precursor to digital yeah. art in the sense that it's endlessly reproducible and the market has decided that in order to make it valuable we need to print it and make editions of six. How do I know that those two very expensive photographs are actually limited edition, right? You've got to trust the gallerist, you gotta trust the, the community you're part of, the artist, and if he gets caught, his credibility goes to hell. Uh, but it's not on a blockchain. It's there's a real trust, the centralized trust structure. And the photography market forever has kind of traded a huge discount to painting. Right. Because even if you trust the gallery, yeah. there's still kind of the yeah. human fetish of like the index of the gesture on the canvas. Um, so. Right, speculation, Bitcoin. So you could convert either back into the print or into any of my future work. So you were kind of investing in me as the artist. Right. And when you sold Bitcoin, what portion of your future you did you think you were selling? 1%, 5%, 10%, your arm, your leg? Well, it was 25 square inches. 25 square inches of you. <laughs> per coin. But it's interesting when like, an artist says, I'm going to sell a piece of my future work. Yeah. It is like, okay, you, here's my foot. Or like, um, we've thought a lot about, can we tokenize athletes, right? You take young athletes and say, geez, we'll give you money up front and we can, you know, people can trade how much money they think you're going to make if yeah. you use money as one way of, art's kind of interesting. You could get 1% of my future sales. Um, Kind of what you did, but just not officially. What did you learn from the experience? Well, hey, is it is it in existence now? Is it still floating so around? So I had, so so, you know, fast forward. So I had pre-minted basically like a very large supply, and it was on its own native chain. And looking back, I would have you know put, had more nodes, but you know at the time this was like not. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that. I'm um, a crypto artist. What? You were an early crypto pioneer. Yeah, yeah. This, so, so it launched in February of 2015. Since then, I worked on bigger projects, a lot of which had to do with how we think about value. Um, the biggest one being Cloud of Petals, which I can, we can talk about. But um, now I am new at doing a reboot of Bitcoin and doing a new release. Um, and it's going to be an auction, a dedicated auction with Philips, the auction house. And each new Bitcoin is, well, it's not a new Bitcoin, but this one, you know, the new backing of Bitcoins are 3,291 pressed petals from my Cloud of Petals project. Actual pressed petals. Actual pressed petals, physical pressed petals. So the coin is backed by a petal, and the petal will be kept where? The petal is kept in, you know, my storage. Right. <laughs> I am in, and this is the, you know, I get to be the steward of these petals, and other people can kind of own it and trade it. Right. Um, and the petals are kind of like, they're sort of an analog proof of work type of thing, because that project, right, I had 16 
men picking and photographing 100,000 rose petals in the former Bell Labs. This was like this giant performance, 30 minutes, 16 millimeter film. And then we used AI to generate new images of rose petals. And there were VR, you know, VR works that were particle systems of rose petals that would react to your gaze with perfume kind of misting around you. But the relic of the whole big performance were these pressed petals because I asked all the men to pick one petal per rose that they considered most beautiful. So there are over 30 petals in a rose, basically. So they would pick one and it's, and it's like their kind of subjectivity. So I keep thinking about NFTs. Yeah. And there's the plethora of them. Yeah. Prices go up, but we always have a supply response. Every creative thinks I've got to put my thing into an NFT. And I think about what will be create long-term value. And I always come to the same things. If it touches something emotionally in me, if it brings back a time and place. And so if I'm at a virtual concert uh, and it's Travis Scott playing on Discord or whatever he played on on, uh, on, on Discord on uh, Fortnite. Fortnite. Um, and all of a sudden a cause balloon, mylar balloon flows over and I, floats over the audience and I see it and I'm like, oh my God, there's a million people watching or a hundred million people watching. That balloon will have a whole lot of value one day because it'll be the balloon we all witness together collectively. Um, and so when I think about, the first thing that pops in my head with the petals is if I experienced the show, if I smelled the perfume, if I was part of, it probably has more value to me. Yeah. Uh, and so... How do you, I don't know how many people watched the show or when they saw it, how do you go beyond that audience? So those people will be like, yes, I'm going to buy this. It's, it's, a, it's a souvenir in some ways. It's a remem memory. Uh, and maybe when Sarah becomes wildly famous like the next Picasso, people will be like, dude, you were at that show. Radical, right? And so that's why we collect things to some degree. Um, how do you broaden the audience of people that want the pedal? You know, when I came up with Cloud of Petals, it was, it was like a folly, right? I, I went to, I saw this completely empty, dusty Bell Labs. And I had this like dream of making this Cloud of Petals. And essentially of, you know, I was thinking very much about the nature of photography changing, about data, right? This was like me harvesting data to model, you know, like the way, you know, companies do harvest our data and model our desire and feed it back to us. And so I was very interested in the future of data and labor and automation and AI. And, and I like stumbled upon Bell Labs. And I mean, it was maybe mid June at the time. And by mid August, I was there with the full setup. And I knew no one was going to be able to see this, right? So I made a movie. <laughs> so I made a 30 minute film that went to a bunch of film festivals. And, and generally, and you know, the exhibition we did in New York, it was like an 8,000 square foot show, three month run, free and open to the public. It got, I think 12 million impressions online. Like right. it got like a lot, of, but that, but real life art is always very limited yeah. by like, by geography that's that's one of the things that i've found difficult like you really are limited by how much i sarah Mayohas can do going from you know one city to another doing different shows yeah. and and to a certain extent we've done some pre-sales with mostly crypto only crypto native kind of investors and the thing that I think the, the winning combination here for them at least is one that I was so early in the space um, that, you know, it's almost like a proto NFT and two that I'm linking it to something physical that I can't go back in time and make more of these pedals and that, you know, these pedals are part of a huge body of work. What's cool about a lot of these projects is they're going to be kind of pioneers in how we start selling things in the digital world. Uh, now when I get the NFT, it's just basically an ownership certificate. I don't have a visual of my flat, my rose, or do I? You have a, a twirling gold coin right. of Bitcoin. Right. 
it would be interesting though, like I'm just making this up as I sit here, that it, in that coin it gives me access to the show. Some, right. Some, so I can go into the metaverse and I'll be like, oh, I'm going to ba- bathe in my 20 really cool rose petals. But to a certain extent, most of this information, like all of, a lot of the cloud of petals information, but just generally with NFTs, um, you know, it's freely available information. Anybody can go watch the film just like anybody can go and you know the it, there's it's interesting now thinking about whether nfts can can give you access to private experiences well if i'm wearing a um an nft jacket to a party where i know people are going to have ar glasses they're going to hit the ar and i'm going to be wearing like dripping in my cool gucci nft one of a kind right i'm going to be showing off this cool jacket um, I want it to be the only one, or one of mm. ten, right? Or that's what gives it, gives it its value. And so, the uniqueness of things, you know, having an NFT that connects to something unique, right? I'm talking about the Urs Fisher egg that's spun around with the the uh, big lighter in it. Uh, and I keep thinking, once you have your glasses, I didn't buy it. I tried to, and I, someone else outbid me. But I could like float it above my shoulder. Yeah. And people with their glasses could see it. And so like your rose petals, even though they're 1,000, no. They're 3,291. 3,291. Each one's different. And so if you collected like 20, you could have like a a rose petal thing. But you kind of want other people not to be able to see them. Um, You could see the film, but not the actual petal. If you redeem your petal you can have the petal if you really want to look at the petal I'll take a photograph of that of the petal for you but it's not really about you know the specific wrinkle one thing that's clear when you have these conversations is that this is such a new space both from a regulatory perspective from how artists involve themselves with it how how users and how fans and as consumers will evolve and so this idea of value coming from your you know creative genius from your life experience that's out there has to be limited to some degree. Yeah. And that's, it's, there's a real interesting relationship right now with creators in the NFT space talking about scarcity. You know, um, to a certain extent, a lot of the digital artists who have done well, they are not creating scarce things. They're doing drops, you know, every few days right with imagery that is a slight iteration on the thing that they just dropped often sometimes with you know these open editions that are like 700 editions of the same image right this is not a scarce yeah so there's two i'm convinced that we're we're launching a business upstairs on one vertical and we originally thought oh it's all this collectibles and i'm like no 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 there's going to be 10% 10% or less collectible. Things that appreciate in value because in life, most shit doesn't appreciate in value. Yeah. The rest are going to be consumables. It's going to be gamified. It's going to be experiential. Like what will you pay for that experience that week, that day, that, that, um, some of it's gambling, right? And so that part, I think that part will die down a little bit over time. Um, but I think you can split NFTs into collectible NFTs and consumable. I'm going to watch keenly. And I actually think the whole space is going to go through this kind of washout, unwashout. Uh, and we won't, really won't know how fine art community or the performance art community participates, uses the NFT space, probably for years. It's also in relation to art, you know, as an artist, you know, I work, I do work that's digital too. Like I could have chosen to make a digital kind of NFT that really just, you know, was more direct, wasn't like this bitch coin that you're yeah. redeem, you know, that you can redeem that is backed by. Well, your and, whole thing is almost like a part of a performance art project. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a conceptual piece. And it also makes me more comfortable with um, the price being so visible. Because as an artist, you know, you put something out there and then the price takes up as much attention 
as the image on you know all of the platforms so far especially when the images are so small and the price tag is so big right um and that's that's kind of dystopic in a way you like you do want a little bit of separation um it doesn't also serve the art because and i think galleries are resisting galleries are very nervous about nfts extremely nervous because Art is served by an illusion of scarcity. It is the gallery's job to make sure you don't think that there are like 20 more in the back room, right? And that they're keeping them for in the future. You know, they're, they're managing oh, 100%. the supply. It's really interesting because right now, most of NFTs have been bought by crypto people. Most of crypto, forget just NFTs, DeFi, NFTs, protocols, 90% is speculative, it's gambling. It's gambling on stuff that is gonna build the architecture of the future. Yeah. I, I don't wanna demean what's going on, I think yeah. what's going on is awesome. But the, the crypto community is a gambling community, uh, in a, certainly in the NFT space. Yeah. That can't last, the, the, the reality is over time, there'll always be some gambling toward, towards it, but it's gotta ha serve a real purpose. And I think galleries are wise to, to not dive in, to, to try to understand the space to, because they spent years cultivating this idea of scarcity. My always advice is go slow, don't be first in some of this stuff because we don't have the displays yet, the, the, the real right. world displays, we don't have the metaverse displays. Uh, well, NFT, because I mean, and this goes, I mean, NFTs are a financial innovation. They're, that's really what they are and they are not ownership you know they're like a cousin of ownership they're like a proof of fandom you know they're a, a token that you can exchange with someone and attach a price to uh that points to an image but doesn't give you any specific rights over that image unless you tie like an actual legal contract to it right um so it's a financial innovation above all else right now uh but also, like, there's a radical piece to it where you can, in the NFT or in a contract, say, okay, I'm an artist, and every time my, my creation sells, I get 15% more than the first price to the last price. And so artists can actually, and, they're like, and their, their families can actually benefit from, you know, producing great works that sell five years, 15, 30 years, 50 years in the future. Where right now, young artist makes 10 awesome paintings, sells them for $3,000 each, uh, gallerist buys nine of them, you know, <laughs> pumps up the two, drives the price up, sells one, drives the price up, sells it, next thing you know, gallerist makes nine times what the artist does. That doesn't seem fair to people. Like kind of the crypto revolution was all around how do we make the world more transparent? How do we make it more egalitarian? How do we cut out the rent taker? Every single creative is looking at this space right now and looking for guidance. Uh, very few have done what you've done, which is kind of created in the space. Because you really didn't create, like it, it's an NFT project. It's not like an NFT, right? Bitcoin the Bitcoin is an, from yeah. 2014? Yeah, it's an ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, I don't think that there is an any earlier known case of art tokenized on the blockchain before Bitcoin. Yeah. No, and at it, the, it, it reminds me more of uh, the whale shark community to some degree. Right. Other than you haven't fostered that community other than yeah. on your projects. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but it's funny because at the time, you know, even though I hope now I'm a little bit more renowned, but at the time... I was, you know, completely unknown and it got picked up by like Wired and Vice and it was like top article on CoinSpeaker, like above Larry Summers talking about Bitcoin. And so I realized I had hit on something and I thought I thought at the time about like, what would it mean for me to do this with other people's artwork or with, you know, works of art that have real value? And then I remember um, the, I don't know, I don't remember totally the specifics, but I remember that early DAO with like $150 million. Yeah, it was like the, the DAO in, uh, the, on the Ethereum. Yeah, and I remember how like Ethereum had to be forked, yep, and yep. I was like, 
Was oh the God. Test case one for Ethereum. Yeah, it like really spooked me. And I was like, okay, this is. <laughs> yeah, you might have to go back and think about Bitcoin as a, a social token, uh, and to create the bitch community. <laughs> you know? Right. Well, how did you come up with the name Bitcoin, other than being? Um, cheeky? I remember I was well. I remember I was like eating eggs when I came up with it, and I was like, I this is just too good, like too good. Um, yeah. Also, like, you know, I'm a young woman, like, kind of reclaiming agency, and bitch is, like, a word that's aggressive, not nice, but also, you know, has been reclaimed over and over again. It's a, it's still kind of titillating Bitcoin. Well, I'm going to go buy myself a Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, do they trade? So there is going to be a public auction on, uh, it'll be announced on, or it, May 18th um, and it'll take place from the 25th to the 28th of May on Phillips. Nice. There'll be bundles of Bitcoins. Bundles of Bitcoins. Yeah. Backed by your Bitches. new photographer. <laughs> backed by the press pedals from Cloud of Pedals. Right. All right, people. That's next with Novo. Sarah, one more time. Mayohas. Mayohas. I've known Sarah for three years now. Yeah. And it's the first time I ever got her last name right. Sarah Mayohas. <laughs> Love it. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah.